second day of the Columbia workshop on brain circuits, memory and computation 2020. Today's first talk is by Dmitry Mitya Chiklowski from Flatiron Institute and is titled A Similarity Preserving Neural Network Trained on Transformed Images Recapitulates Salient Features of the Fly Motion Detection Circuit. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so this is a long title, um, but uh, the talk is really about how brains detect visual motion. And I thought it would be appropriate to start the talk uh, by showing uh, this optical illusion, if, if it works. Can you see it? Did the video go through? Yeah. So what you're seeing is kind of uh, paradoxical because you can see the snow continuously um, moving towards you but it doesn't really advance. So what's going on? Well, the explanation is that uh, this is a looped sequence of four images. I'm going to step through them now. So the first two are the regular images and then the shifted version of the regular image and then the negative and then the shifted negative and so on. And uh, to explain uh, what's going on here, I need to invoke something that is called uh, the phi and reverse phi illusions, um, which work as follows. So the phi illusion is if you have an object that has shifted, say, downwards in two consecutive frames, then you perceive emotion downwards. By now, we're so used to uh, videos and uh, Hollywood films that we don't really think of this as an illusion, but that's what's called phi illusion, seems completely natural. Uh, but the next step is when you have uh, the, the spot actually jump upwards, but change contrast as it does that. And then you perceive that also as motion downwards. And that's what's called the reverse phi illusion. In the next frame, the black spot uh, moves downwards again, and that's a regular phi illusion, so you perceive it as a downward motion, and then the whole sequence loops again uh, by changing the contrast and the spot moving up, so again, you perceive motion downwards. So at every frame transition here, you perceive motion downwards, right? But um, of course, the spot doesn't ever advance. The reason I wanted to show this illusion uh, is because uh, it is actually shared by most visual animals, uh, including um, not just uh, humans and vertebrates, uh, but also invertebrates and even fruit flies. And so since the illusion like this is shared among all these brains, it is reasonable to think that the mechanism of motion detection is also shared between them, at least on the algorithmic level. And so to understand how our brains process visual motion, we are going to study this problem in fruit flies. So here is how we know that fruit flies can perceive visual motion. Um, similar videos you also saw in the talks by uh, Gabby Maimon um, and, and, and uh, Mika Jusela. So this fly is watching a visual stimulus moving to the right, but it would like to turn to the right, but it's glued to the apparatus and cannot turn its body. But it thinks it's, it's turning because it's turning the sphere underneath its feet. And the rotation of the sphere is reported by the black line here on the left. So you can see that the fly perceives motion because it seems to be trying to turn in the direction of the moving stimulus. Now, when the direction of the moving stimulus is reversed, the fly is trying to turn into the opposite direction. You can see by black line here. And at the same time, in the same fly, they're monitoring the activity of this giant neuron HS, which reports leftward motion. 
and that's shown by this green line. So you can see that experimentally we can have both behavioral and physiological readout of motion detection in flies. So this is of course um, just a regular phi illusion, not reverse phi. But the same experiment can be done for reverse fly. So the big question is, how do flies um, perceive visual motion? And uh, this problem has a very long history. Uh, going back to the work of Hassenstein and Riker uh, more than 60 years ago, uh, who proposed this incredibly simple scheme uh, where signals from two photoreceptors point at the adjacent locations in the visual field are being combined after passing one of the signals through a time delay. So if there is a stimulus moving leftward, it excites the right foot receptor before the left one, but before, because of the time delay, the two signals arrive at the multiplication unit at the same time, get nonlinear and enhanced, and signal leftward motion. If I build a mirror reflection of this motion detector, then similarly, I will be able to detect rightward motion where the delay is now on the left arm of the detector. By combining two such mirror reflected units into one, um, we get uh, with opposite signs, we get what is called a balanced elementary motion detector, the way Hassenstein and Reichert proposed it. And that motion detector signals rightward motion with positive sign and um, leftward motion with negative sign. So this uh, model of motion detection acquired a almost canonical status in the field of invertebrate uh, visual neuroscience, and not just because of its simplicity, but also because of the many very um, a serious and impressive uh, experimental tests of the predictions of this model. Most of these predictions were verified experimentally over half a century. And so you would think that the issue would have been closed, but actually that's not the case. And the reason is that all of those experimental tests were actually indirect. And to explain what what I mean by the indirect tests, I have to tell you a little bit about the fly visual system. So um, as you already heard in previous talks, uh, flies have compound eyes consisting of about 800 microlenses. And behind each microlens, there are photoreceptors. And uh, collectively, they're all referred to as the retina in a fly. And then the photoreceptors project uh, their uh, axons into retinotopically organized layers which process that visual information. Those layers are called lamina, medulla, lobula, and lobular plate. So what has been known for a while is that the neurons in the lamina have no directional selectivity. That means they respond uh, equally to the stimulus moving in either direction. At the same time, these giant neurons of the lobular plate um, actually respond to the motion anywhere in the visual field because they integrate the motion signals over the whole visual field. One of those giant directional neurons was the neuron HS, calcium signal in which I showed in uh, the beginning of the talk. So um, the reason I said that um, the tests of the hassenstein reichert uh, model were indirect is because um, those giant neurons actually uh, don't detect motion themselves. They integrate motion over the visual field. And it was thought that the local motion detection happens in the layer called the medulla, where hypothetically hassenstein reichert detectors were supposed to be located. And those detectors would project to the, um, this giant directional interneurons, which integrate, would integrate their signals. So the reason um, that the tests were indirect is because nobody was able until 
uh, the last decade or so to study either the anatomy or the physiology of the medulla. And all the experimental tests relied either on physiology by recording from those giant directional interneurons of the lobular plate, uh, the, that's the work of um, uh, Borst or uh, Rob De Reuter and Bill Dalek, if you know, and um, or or behavioral readouts, which are also governed by the signals from those giant directional neurons. But again, uh, nobody could penetrate the mystery of the medulla because the neurons and the processes were, were extremely small and highly entangled. Um, it remained a mystery. So what has become clear uh, about uh, 10 years ago is the identity of the cells that uh, provide the local motion signal from uh, individual um, columnar computations in the medulla. And those are the cells called T4s. Um, there are about four of them per medulla column, each of the T4 responsible for one of the four cardinal direction and they uh, project onto the to giant neurons. But what kind of circuit uh, feeds into T4 was not really known. And that's where we got into the game. And um, by we, I mean Tom and um, we uh, uh, assembled um, the first of the kind high throughput uh, complete um, reconstruction pipeline that started with electron microscopy images and produced the connectome. Uh, you heard about um, the recent results from that project in the first talk of the meeting from Steve Plaza. And um, so I'm not going to go into the technical details, but just uh, show you uh, the movie that illustrates the reconstruction. So ho hopefully the movie is coming through. So you can see the shapes of neurons. Yes. The volume that covers about seven medulla columns and so we have all the identities of all those neurons. And in addition, because this is electron microscopy imaging, we can identify all the synapses and count the number of synaptic contacts between all of the connected neurons. And we will use those counts further down in the talk to estimate the strengths of connections. So we have been able to assemble the medulla connectome from this uh, data, but I'm going to spare you all the details of this and just show you the part of the connectome that is relevant to the problem of visual motion detection. That is the circuit, the inputs and the circuit that leads onto that cell T4 that detects motion locally in one particular direction. So each T4 gets inputs from several adjacent, uh, uh, several adjacent columns um, shown, uh, but here I'm going to uh, present you, uh, for, for now I'm going to present you only with the cartoon of the connectivity uh, based on the three adjacent columns from the medulla. So in those three columns, information from photoreceptors that is relevant to this problem is carried in three channels um, designated by the um, neuron subtypes and the different colors. The difference between those pathways can be seen in the physiologically recorded um, impulse response, where you can see that the green and the red channels are simply low pass filtering the photoreceptor signals but they do so with opposite signs. The blue channel has a biphasic response. So one can think about it as a taken temporal derivative on the photoreceptor signal. 
So all those three channels are available in each one of those three columns. Now let's look at the connectivity of the T4 cell that is responsible for the motion to the right. And this is um, the work of uh, Shinya Takemura, um, a brilliant scientist at Genelia, who found that the synaptic connections from those three channels onto T4s are highly specific. Even though this T4 could potentially access inputs from each of those three channels in each pixel, it only grabs input from the green channel in this pixel, blue channel in this pixel, and red channel in this pixel. And to convince you that this must have something to do with local motion detection, I'll show you another cartoon that is of the connectivity of the leftward motion detecting T4 cell. You can see that it is also highly selective in which channels it actually um, synapses with, but the inputs are flipped. So the green and the red channels are um, received from the um, opposite sides of the central pixel. Only the derivative channel uh, is received uh, from the central pixel in both T4s. So after seeing such data, it is reasonable to think that this has something to do with the circuitry and the algorithm of the motion detection. But you can also see that this doesn't easily map onto the hassenstein record motion detector. For example, the hassenstein record motion detector combines inputs from two photoreceptor channels, not from three, as was seen in connectomics in the fruit fly. So what is going on here? To understand how this quantum could give rise to motion detection, I think we should step back and think about motion detection in very basic terms. So imagine that you have some kind of an object with this kind of light intensity as a function of the spatial coordinate. So it's a one dimensional image, okay? And suppose it shifts from frame to frame to the right. While it does so, the object um, brightness does not change but because the object moves, the pixel intensity that the fly uh, retina registers, of course, changes, goes from the red to the blue line. In order to detect motion, we will need a relationship that ties together the temporal change in the uh, light uh, pixel intensity or the temporal derivative with the displacement from frame to frame, theta t, which is the uh, speed of motion times the interframe interval. As you know from basic calculus, the ratio of those two uh, quantities is equal to the spatial derivative of the pixel intensity. So you have this kind of relationship between the spatial derivative of pixel intensity the temporal change in the pixel intensity from frame to frame, and the shift of the image between frames. If the fly uh, uh, neuronal circuit were to measure the spatial uh, uh, derivative, the temporal derivative, it could use this equation to compute the shift. But of course, because of noise, simply solving this direct, uh, equation directly is not a good idea. And so instead, the more robust solution is to optimize this objective function, where here you have squared the mismatch of this kind of a relationship, where the temporal derivative is balanced by theta times the spatial derivatives. And the additional term, which is called the regularizer, you can think of this whole thing as um, 
uh, in an Bayesian framework, you can think of this as a log prior and log likelihood for Gaussian distributed uh, signals. Or you can just recognize that this simply is a ridge regression. And as such, it has a closed form solution that you can recognize here. It turns out, and this is based on the recent work from uh, Dalek and De Reuter, uh, that the flies are likely to be in the low signal to noise regime most of the time. And that means that the denominator is dominated by lambda, and we can just drop the star. Then the mm, speed of motion is simply proportional to the uh, derivative, temporal derivative and spatial derivative, um, the product of temporal and spatial. So um, we could call this as um, a derivative correlator motion detector. Now let's go back to the neural circuit and see how it can implement this computation. So, as I already told you, the blue channel that carries, uh, carries the derivative of the photoreceptor signal from each pixel. And so we can have access to that temporal derivative from the central pixel. Now we need to compute the spatial derivative, which is just the difference in pixel intensity of adjacent pixels. But if we just subtracted the pixel intensity from i and i minus first pixel, that computation would be centered in a different location than the computation of derivative. So a better way to do it is to combine the estimate of the spatial derivative to the left and to the right of the central pixel. And so the spatial derivative is approximated as the difference of the signal from i plus first and i minus first pixel. And that estimate is centered the same place as the temporal derivative is. Now you can see how this computation can be implemented by the circuit that came out of the fly connectomics. The blue channel in the central pixel supplies the temporal derivative to the T4. The green and the red channels carry the pixel intensity with opposite signs. So by combining them, the neuron can take the difference. And if there is a nonlinear interaction between that difference and the temporal derivative supplied by the blue channel, it can compute the motion velocity by multiplying the spatial and the temporal derivative. Uh, I have to say that um, the mechanism on nonlinear interactions here are still not fully understood, and I'll talk about this in a little bit. But the nice thing about this uh, schematics is that we can already understand physiological observation, such as the uh, phi and the reverse phi illusion. So the phi illusion appears when um, the leftmost pixel is stimulated first, and then with the same contrast, the central pixel is stimulated. Then the fly perceives the motion to the right, of course. And you can see why. Uh, this is because the increase in the contrast on the left pixel results in the negative signal in the red channel, which is inverted by this inhibitory synapse and provides a positive input to the T4, which is also low pass filtered. Then when there is a step up in light intensity in the central pixel, the blue channel estimates its derivative and provides a positive input in the T4. Those two inputs interact with each other and result in the 
uh, excitation of T4 signal in rightward motion. Similarly, to understand reverse phi illusion, when we lower the contrast on the rightmost pixel, the green channel responds negatively, inhibitory synapse flips the sign and gives the positive input to T4, which interacts again because of the low pass filtering, it hangs around and interacts with the temporal derivative of the input to the central pixel. It is actually important that the, uh, both in phi and reverse phi illusions, it's important that the signals are presented to this particular pixels. If one were to shift the presentations to nearby pixel, say first stimulate in central and then the side pixel, then in this T4 cell, one would not get an excitation. And this has been demonstrated experimentally uh, by the lab of Damon Clark. And it corresponds to this uh, mechanistic view of what's going on in the circuit uh, obtained from connectomics. So it seems that this derivative correlation detector can account for both phi and reverse phi illusions. And now I sh should say a few words about the nonlinear interactions that were first hypothesized by Hassenstein and Reichert, um, but are needed, of course, for motion detection. So I think that the jury is still out. Um, there are a lot of papers uh, proposing um, models and uh, uh, also reporting experimental results, some of which suggest that the summation is dendri in dendrites is purely linear, and then the nonlinearity happens further downstream in the axons, perhaps, or their terminals, and others see nonlinear interactions in the dendrites. Whichever way it happens, I think the general framework, as captured by the derivative correlation motion detectors, still works because all that is needed is some kind of nonlinearity between those two inputs. So um, another question you might have is, um, how is it uh, possible that uh, this model is correct if um, I said in the beginning that experimental work over half a century uh, verified the predictions of hassenstein reichert model? Uh, so what's what's going on to ha what's going to happen with those experimental results? Well, it, it, it's actually uh, rather unexpected, at least for us. But it turns out that although the output of individual um, derivative correlation motion detector is different from the output of um, a balanced hassenstein reichert elementary motion detector, once the outputs of those detectors are summed over the whole visual field. It's a basic mathematical fact that the output is equivalent, barring some side effects from the edge pixels. Okay, so this is something just one can algebraically show that our derivative correlation motion detector will, once integrated over the visual field, will give uh, exactly the same output. So therefore, the prediction of our model, when tested indirectly from those giant uh, directional neurons, are the same as that of the hassenstein reichert model. And therefore, our derivative correlation detector model inherits all the successful verifications of the hassenstein reichert model prediction. Okay, so up to now, I um, based my um, explanation on the cartoon version of the connectivity between the three channels and the T4 cell. But uh, now it's time to look at the actual connectomics data. And that's what it looks like. Uh, I have to explain to you what this means. So um, now we're looking at uh, the uh, lattice of uh, medulla columns uh, 
um, as if you were looking uh, straight on top of the fly eye. So this hexagonal lattice corresponds to the, com the compound eye of the fly. And um, this row of um, figures gives the counts of synaptic contacts onto one particular T4 cell that is centered on uh, the, the middle pixel here. Each of those um, of daisy flowers uh, gives the counts of synaptic contacts that that T4 receives from a different channel. So the leftmost daisy gives the counts of synaptic contacts from MI1s that live in the corresponding uh, seven columns. You can see that the majority of the inputs come from the central uh, pixel, just as shown in the cartoon. Now the MI4 inputs, they come from this three pixels uh, with the uh, weights shown here by the numbers. And although it's not as binary as the cartoon suggested, it is still true that most of those inputs are to the right of the central pixel. Now the red MI9 inputs come from the left of the central pixel onto the same T4. And that's what justifies this cartoon. But as you can see by the counts of synapses on this T4, and the other T4s centered on the same pixel, but responsible for the motion de detection in four cardinal directions, you can see that um, they receive synaptic inputs from the, the corresponding columns, just as was represented by the cartoon, so I didn't lie. But also what this picture illustrates that the inputs are in the circuit is highly non-binary. And each of those T4, T4s has its own envelope of inputs that are individually adjusted and uh, balanced to detect motion. Why am I making such a big deal out of it other than you know, showing you the true data and uh, trying to prove that my cartoon is correct? Well, because um, how do you think this circuit could have wired up, okay? So of course we know that genes play a crucial role in wiring up the visual circuitry in the fly. But I cannot possibly imagine that all those numbers, all those synaptic counts, which are different for each T4 cell and for each kind of input and for each location in the retina, could have been programmed genetically. And therefore we believe that this counts of synapses have been tuned by activity dependent plasticity, by synaptic learning rules that responded to some kind of input. Uh, it is of course known that fly circuitry is not rigid and has been shown that the counts of synapses in the lamina even vary um, by at least 10, 20% um, with the circadian cycle. Um, but it has not been proven that this happens in the activity dependent manner. So this is of course a hypothesis, but I find it hard to um, explain how you could wire up the circuitry with all those uh, various synaptic weights without it. So the circuit got wired up with activity dependent synaptic plasticity rule, then the question is, what kind of an algorithm could those plasticity rules implement? Could this visual motion detector be learned from data without supervision? What I mean by that, if a neural network were shown videos of natural scenes, would it be able to wire up the circuitry with this kind of connection weights? And of course, no one is telling that circuitry uh, that it's doing a good or bad job. It just has to learn it from the motion in the, those videos 
in an unsupervised manner. And to start answering this question, uh, we came up with a model where such kind of a neural network can in fact learn a motion detector using just biologically plausible uh, local learning rules. In the interest of time, I can't go into the details, but I'll just give you a bird's eye view of what we did. So the goal here is to learn the motion detector. That, that same um, derivative correlation motion detector that I tried to explain to you to build up intuition. The starting point for this is in the work of Rao and Ruderman, who pointed out that if you have a shifted image between time frame t and t plus one, and here xt is a vector, each component of which represents an intensity of a corresponding pixel. So the difference in the pixel intensity vector delta xt, just like our derivative before delta t xt, can be expressed as a linear operation or simply matrix A the is xt scaled by the velocity theta t. A is also known translations. This will be a generator of translations. This is C, which is simply a spatial derivative. But what we would like to do here is to not postulate that this is a spatial derivative, but to learn the form of A from data by presenting pairs of shifted images to the circuit and have the circuit detect the magnitude of each shift as well as learn this generator A, which will be essential to the shift of the shift. To give you an idea of how this can be done, you can think of this problem as linear regression, right? Because xt is um, scaled by something to produce this delta xt. So if you measure delta xt and xt, you could compute the scaling factor, right? And you know that for the regression, you have this kind of expression uh, that theta t a is the outer product of delta xt uh, and xt transpose divided by the uh, covariance of the input. So if I were to widen my inputs before the input, I could drop this part. And then you can see that theta a is proportional to this outer product of the change in intensity and intensity, which you call the outer product feature. Of course, this isn't really linear regression because for each such pair, the value of theta is different. It's only a that remains the same. So this is more like principle component analysis, not linear regression. And so it turns out that indeed, if we perform a principal component analysis <coughs> on this outer product feature, that we can learn this matrix A that is a generator of translations. And it has this shape that we, of course, expected because we know that in this simple case is just a spatial derivative where, where on the main diagonal you have zeros, here you have ones and here you have minus ones. So by sandwiching that matrix between the delta x and x, we can compute the magnitude of the displacement. And this of course is the same kind of computation as was captured by our derivative correlation motion detection because this is just temporal derivative. And then the multiplication of A by X computes the spatial derivative. But the big difference here is that we did not postulate the form of matrix A by hand. We did not say that this has to be a spatial derivative. We learned it from the data in an unsupervised manner by just presenting pairs of shifted images. Okay, so that's the main result here. And uh, if we interpret 
the, the synaptic weights as implementing this matrix A operating on the inputs from the photoreceptors. Then we can think of that a circuit as having been learned in an unsupervised manner from um, motion in natural videos. So yes, in fact, there can be a neural circuit that um, learns from uh, natural stimuli and forms a local motion detector. Okay, now you might say, well, you actually knew the result you were supposed to get. This is a spatial derivative, so maybe this is just way too simple. Can you learn something more interesting? Well, in fact, we can. And just to give you one example, um, it is um, known that the flies can detect not just spatial translation, but also spatial rotation. But also spatial rotation, because to fly, it's important to know the rotation speed around these three directions of motion, the pitch, the yaw, and the raw. And the flies have neurons in those, those giant tangential neurons that we talked about before that actually specialize in detecting rotation in around each of those axes. For example, this neuron has this particular uh, optic flow field that um, it detects that corresponds to a roll detector. So now we took uh, pairs of natural images, but not displaced, but rotated, and presented them to our algorithm with uh, biologically plausible local learning rules and looked at what the network learned. And what it learned, in fact, uh, were this local detectors that have uh, positive and negative inputs from the uh, three adjacent pixels, but oriented in a particular way that corresponds to the rotation around this central pixel. So then the generator of rotations combines inputs from all those local pixels as represented, sorry, by this um, local detectors. And we think that this corresponds to what's happening in the actual fly where this giant uh, roll detector neurons combines inputs from T4s of corresponding orientation in different location of the visual field. But now here we can learn the circuitry in the unsupervised fashion and therefore explain how it could have arisen in development. So um, what I talked to you about so far was motion detection in flies. What of course we want to know about is motion detection in mammals, especially humans. But I think that now that we have figured out a learning algorithm that could learn motion detector. We can apply the same framework to the, um, to the mammalian uh, circuits as well. And if we adjust the natural stimulus statistics to the kind that mammals would receive, we hope to learn motion detectors that will be found in the retinas of mice, for example. Moreover, the results um, that I told to you about of learning motion detectors have application beyond this particular problem. Because this, uh, uh, the motion detection problem is the simplest example of learning content invariant transformations. What I mean by content invariant transformations, if I have the same object, like the same face, and it just shifted, but didn't change its identity, then it's content invariant transformation. And motion is, of course, an example of that. This is just by illusion. So by learning such content invariant transformation, we can solve the problem of pattern recognition, hopefully, uh, because the main difficulty of this problem is the fact that if you want to differentiate between the two faces, the two people, you have to struggle with the problem that the um, 
the, the you know, same side view of two different faces on the pixel level appears more similar than two different views of the same face. And so what your neural network has to do is to, um, if you think about representing pixel intensity uh, vectors, stimuli pixel intensity vectors in this high dimensional space, they live on this highly entangled manifolds in the pixel intensity space. But what you would like to do is to disentangle those manifolds uh, so that you can classify the faces using a linear classifier uh, to be learned between them. And this kind of a disentangling of factorization is thought to be central to the solving the problem of pattern recognition. And since our work on learning a motion detector um, gives a solution to the simplest version of this problem, we think that it opens the door to solving this problem in a biologically plausible way. So to summarize, I hope I was able to communicate uh, that uh, learning uh, um, image translations uh, using uh, this outer product features results in a learning algorithm uh, that when trained on natural images, recapitulates the motion detector architecture in Drosophila and reproduces both anatomy and physiology. And so it's in agreement with a lot of experimental facts. And also, as I just mentioned, we think that this is just the first step towards learning of generic content invariant transformations, which are central to pattern recognition. And finally, I would like to thank um, the two people that did most of the work, Yanis Pohrun and Anirvan Singhuta. Uh, I was privileged uh, to collaborate with this uh, distinguished scientist. Thank you. Thank you, Mitya. Um, any questions can be posted to Q&A. Um, there's already one question in Q&A. Mitya, can you see it? Uh, yes. Um, so this is from Wen Hao Zhang. Um, it is very interesting that you learn the generator of rotations. I'm wondering, that is the rotation in your model 2D or 3D? A big challenge of 3D rotation is that the 3D rotation generators are non-commutative. How did you deal with this non-commutative generators? Uh, so this is actually an excellent question. And my answer is very simple, that this is just 2D rotations. So we haven't dealt with this yet, uh, but we are um, hoping to deal with this now. And so any, if you have any thoughts, I, I would love to hear um, them from you. Okay, there is another question uh, from Matthew Farrell. Uh, PCA and similarity matching typically constrains weight matrices to be orthonormal. Is this accounted for in your framework? So this is also a very good question, actually. Uh, the weight matrices may or, or may not be orthonormal. Uh, so the reason is that um, uh, what is orthonormal is the projection matrices and they combine out of the um, feed forward weight matrices um, pre-multiplied by the inverse of the lateral connections without going into the details of the similarity matching framework. So, and this is something very hard to, um, to check. Also, I have to point out that PCA is um, a really nice model but it's of course oversimplified because it doesn't take into account the nonlinearity in neurons. And what we actually uh, try to do to model the nonlinearity, instead of PCA, we performed clustering and it gave uh, slightly different results. And in clustering, uh, the interests don't have so it helps. Another question from uh, Jacob Port. Um, what do you think about T5? Uh, 
the first question. So, so is a motion detected on pathway the five motion detection there is slightly different in that can you stop for a while um the the audio is not very uh, that smooth um can you try it again yeah so with and my answer is that we think that the difference in the t5 circuit reflects the difference in the statistics of off and on channels in uh, the, the fly sees. Um, however, we don't have the, uh, those um, results. This is just the guess. The second question is, Dalek et al. found differences between low versus high SNR regimes. Does this work with your model? Um, so if you're referring to the, um, if you're referring to the Porter's and Bellick work uh, that suggested that there should be different optimal calculation, it is certainly to be expected that uh, we would learn different detectors in the low and high scenario, scenario regimes. But I'm not sure this would be the same, exactly the same kind of detectors that they would have obtained. And experimentally, uh, I think there is no data on that. Um, another question from Sarath uh, Ravindran. Uh, do you already have results from the pattern recognition with the content invariant transformations? Um, not, not really. So um, the, 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 the very last uh, slide of my talk is um, forward looking. Uh, we think that this uh, content invariant transformations um, when learned, would allow us to do pattern recognition, uh, but that work is ongoing. Okay, well, the, if there, uh, oh, will the slides of your talk be uploaded? It. Yes, I'm happy to upload the slides of the talk, but also I think it's been recorded and it will be on YouTube. Is that correct, Ian? Yes, uh, it's going to uh, be on YouTube. Uh, please check our website after uh, after the workshop. Uh, and um, before I answer the next question, I, before I forget, I want to thank the organizers of this meeting uh, who did such enormous work to pull it all together. I, I'm really uh, applauding um, their effort. Um, okay, there, another, que another question is, is there a way to frame your framework in an evolutionary manner? Well, so um, not sure exactly what you're asking, but you know, whenever we talk about how the circuits came about um, and, and we invoke learning, we're never really sure what part of that learning took place uh, during the development and the life of that particular animal versus what has happened in the evolutionary time scale and is reflected in the genes. So um, yes, I'm sure that evolution had something to do with it, but it's hard to tell which, which part evolution is responsible for. Next question. Um, from Shavika, uh, does Drosophila use this content invariant transformations for pattern recognition? Uh, <laughs> excellent question. I don't know. I actually know very little uh, about pattern recognition in Drosophila. And I think this is actually one of the questions that um, the connectome that was released by the Janelia uh, Fly Connectome Project that Steve Plaza talked about um, would help to answer. Uh, 